Hello and welcome back to my channel. In this video, we will be discussing the sugarcane industry of Guyana. Sugarcane is a tall semi-perennial grass from which sugar is extracted. It is between two to six meters tall with stout jointed fibrous stalks rich in sucrose, which accumulates in the internodes of the stalk. Sugar cane typically consists of 12% sucrose, 15% fiber, 70% water and 3% salts and organic compounds. Sugarcane goes through four important phases as it grows. These are germination phase, tillering phase, grand growth phase, and the ripening and maturing phase. The germination phase occurs four to six weeks uh, after the sugarcane is planted and involves the activation and subsequent, subsequent sprouting of vegetative buds. The second phase is the tillering and canopy development phase, which occurs between eight to 18 weeks after the crop is planted. This involves the formation of secondary sprouts from underground buds. The third phase is the grand growth phase, which involves the elongation of the sugar cane. This occurs 20 to 38 weeks after the cane is planted. The final phase is the ripening and maturing phase where sugar synthesis takes place and simple sugar gets converted to sucrose. This occurs between 42 to 50 weeks after the sugar cane is planted. Much sunshine is needed in this phase for sucrose accumulation to take place. When the sugar cane is fully matured, it is, its sucrose content can be extracted and used, uh, for example, as a sweetener. Each phase of the sugar cane growth cycle requires favorable environmental conditions and effective crop management strategies to promote optimum productivity. Now, most of these environmental conditions we are talking about exist in the tropical countries such as those of the Caribbean. It is for this reason that the history of the Caribbean is so closely connected to the sugarcane industry. However, the Caribbean sugar industry has evolved and has today given way in importance to other industries such as manufacturing and tourism in many of the territories. One exception to this is Guyana. In fact, Guyana is currently the largest producer of sugar cane in CARICOM. Though sugar cane is grown by a few independent farmers in Guyana, most sugar cultivation is carried out by the state-owned sugar company, Gaisuko, which manages the existing sugar estates and accompanying factories. All of the sugar estates are located along the narrow coastal strip of Guyana. 
to the north of the area is the Oit Flut uh, uh, estate located to the eastern bank of the Essequibo River. Wales Estate is located on the western coast of the Demerara River. Both estates are situated between 15 to 29 kilometers away from Georgetown, which is the capital city of Guyana. On the eastern bank of the Demerara River is the Labon Intention or LBI Estate, which is the current location of Guy Sukho's head office. LBI has been merged with Ogle Estate, Diamond Estate, and more recently, Endmore Estate to form the East Demerara Estate. Now, as we look further south, we can see the Blairmont Estate, which is located on the west bank of the Burbees River. East of the Burbees River are the Albion and Rosal Estates. The most southern estate located on the western bank of the Corentine River is Skeldon Estate. Now let's talk about the acreage and field layout of these estates. The total land on which Gaisuko's estates grow sugar is about 470 kilometers square. The largest producing estate is Albion Estate with over 19,110 0.5 acres of sugar under cultivation. The individual fields on the estates are between four to seven hectares. They are empoldered and surrounded on three sides by high level transport or irrigation canals and a drainage canal on the fourth side. Within the fields, the sugar cane is grown on beds separated by drains with a depth of 80 centimeters, which lead to an infield collector drain, which in turn discharges water into the main drainage canal. The beds are of different designs, including hammered bed, ridge and furrow bed, and broad beds. The cambered beds are the traditional layout created by the Dutch, who were the original planters. And this field layout was created to aid with drainage. However, this layout inhibits the use of infield machinery so that field operations must be carried out manually. The ridge and furrow layout was introduced in the 1970s to allow some mechanization of planting and interrow tillage while allowing the manual cutting and loading of the sugar cane. Significant areas of cambered beds were converted to broadbed layout during the 1980s. This layout makes it easier for mechanization. The climate along the coastal strip is tropical marine climate. This climate is known for being under the influence of onshore northeast trade winds. Temperatures are high with very little variation throughout the year. Mean temperatures range from 25 to 32 degrees Celsius. Unlike other tropical marine territories of the Caribbean, Guyana is not usually influenced by hurricanes as it lies south of the path of the Atlantic hurricane belt. However, the country 
being located along the equator is subjected to the intertropical convergence zone, which brings two periods of very heavy rainfall per year. Average annual rainfall is about 2,000 millimeters, ranging from 1,700 millimeters at Skeldon Estate on the extreme east to 2,700 millimeters at Oitflut Estate on the western limit of the cane growing area. The rivers which drain the area are important to the productivity of the estates. The estates are able to take advantage of the water for irrigation purposes, especially during times of drought. Additionally, sediments brought down by the rivers help to create fertile alluvial soils for the plants to grow. The estates are well linked by the main road running along the coast, as we can see on the map. The sugar can be easily exported from ships at ports such as Georgetown, Blairmont, and Skeldon. To secure the coastal strip against inundation due to its low-lying relief, a system of dams and dikes, canals and pumps have been developed behind a seawall along the Atlantic coast. Now, though the use of technology for sugarcane cultivation is not as extensive in Guyana as it is in other places such as Brazil, it is not non-existent. In fact, more efforts are being made to invest more in technology because of the advantages that technology offers. Mechanization means more work can be done in a shorter period of time and it can also reduce labor cost. Among the types of machinery used in Ghana's sugarcane fields are tilling machines, cane loaders, and combined harvesters. Drone technology has also been introduced, which helps to provide frequent and high resolution data about crops and field conditions. However, Guyana has a long way to go where technology is concerned. This requires much capital, not only for the purchase of the technology, but also for the conversion of the fields to facilitate the technology. Since the speed of the introduction of technology is not taking place fast enough, the industry is still largely dependent on manual labor. Though the industry has experienced brain drain and most young people have little interest in farming, there are still a significant proportion of the country's workforce who rely on Gaisuko for their employment. Labor is needed in the field to carry out a variety of tasks from land preparation, planting, soil management, as well as the harvesting of the crop. Labor exists at various levels from those who directly interact with the sugar cane in the field to those who manage the field operations as well as those who carry out scientific research in areas such as pest control. 
the area across which the estates are located is also the area where most of Guyana's population is concentrated, as shown by the Coropleth map to the right. The darker shades on the map indicates areas of higher densities and are mainly located along the coast. In fact, though this coastal belt, which only takes up 5% of the country's total land area, sorry, though this coastal belt only takes up 5% of the country's total land area, it is home to more than 90% of the country's population. So this means that there is a ready supply of labor for the sugar industry. Now, the overall business on the estate is the growth and production of a healthy crop of sugarcane suitable for sugar extraction. To achieve this gold, goal, sorry, farmers must monitor the sugarcane through its four growth phases with a readiness to respond to its needs in an efficient and effective manner. When growing sugar cane, it is a common practice for the old roots left in the ground from the previous harvest to be used to produce new plants. These old roots are called ratoons and the process is known as ratooning. Ratooning is repeated up to four times after which the field is tilled and replanted. As a soil management strategy, flood following is practice which involves fields being submerged in fresh water, usually after tillage for about six to 12 months. Flood following often occurs after the fields have been cropped for two successive plant and ratoon cycles. This practice helps to enhance the physical properties of the soil. For example, the nitrogen availability is enhanced, weed seed reserves are destroyed and soil pests are killed. Flood following is only practiced on the marine clay soil group since soils with high silt and fine sand contents are not conducive to this practice. After the beds are prepared, it is time for new seedlings to be planted. Planting is usually done just before the start of the rainy season so that the plants can grow from, sorry, so that the plants can have enough rain while it is growing. Since there are two periods of rain, the crops are usually planted twice per year. The plant is vulnerable to a variety of pests while growing. Field pests include weeds, insects, and rodents. The cane is especially vulnerable during the germination phase where Weeds compete with the roots for nutrients. Stem borers are common pests which penetrate the cane stalk. Frog hoppers are also common in poorly drained soils. Since the use of chemical pesticides has adverse effects, 
they are being phased out and being replaced by biological control methods, which are more environmentally friendly. This requires the use of parasites in the field. Sugarcane requires a high moisture supply during most of its growth phases. Due to the variability in climatic conditions, sufficient water is not always available. As such, the field must often be irrigated. This is done through the extensive canal system which runs through the cane field. During times of flood, on the other hand, flood waters must be pumped out at pumping stations installed along the coast. One of the advantages of ratooning is that it does not pull out all of the nutrients from the soil each time the crop is harvested. Nevertheless, the more the soil is cultivated, the more it loses nutrients and the soil becomes depleted. This makes it necessary for fertilizers to be used to replenish the soil. Fertilizers do come with a certain disadvantage, one of which is the release of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere, as well as the pollution of water sources. To reduce these problems, farmers must monitor the type of fertilizer used as well as the way it is applied. To reduce the use of chemical fertilizers, products left over from the processing of the sugarcane are applied to the field as organic fertilizers. These include cane trash or bagasse, which is left after the cane has been juiced. Press mud, which is the residue from the filtration of the sugarcane juice, is another product used in the field as fertilizer. Punts are sometimes used to transport and distribute the fertilizers in the field. Additionally, Aircrafts are also used to distribute the fertilizer in an even and timely manner. In addition to fertilizers, aircrafts are also used in the distribution of herbicides and ripeners. Let's talk a bit about ripeners. The ripening and maturing phase requires a sunshine and low humidity. However, conditions in Guyana are often quite humid and therefore not conducive for the natural ripening of the sugar cane. If chemical ripeners are not applied, the sucrose content in the sugar cane will be relatively low. So when the crop is... Uh, fully grown, fully matured, it is time for harvesting. Harvesting usually takes place during the dry season. However, sometimes when the cane is ready for harvesting, there may still be heavy rains, which makes the harvesting period a difficult one. Since about 70% of the estate fields are still occupied by the narrow cambered beds, a manual system of cutting and loading cane is still required for harvesting. The manual operation, though slow and costly, has the advantage of being relatively independent of, soil, of the soil moisture status. Manual cutting also ensures that the cane is cut as close as possible to its base, which is important since the sucrose content in the cane stalk is greatest at ground level. Before harvesting, the fields are usually burned to make it easier for cutting. The workers cut the cane, top them, and place them in piles which can later be taken up. 
for transportation. On some fields, loading is carried out by a type of machinery known as loaders. On a few of the fields, sugarcane is harvested mechanically. The Skeldon estate has been the main driver for this. But these fields to facilitate this type of harvesting, they had to first be converted to the wide bed layouts. Mechanical harvesting reduces the amount of money which has to be paid out in salary to cane cutters and allows more work to be done in a shorter space of time. This in turn ensures guaranteed and consistent cane supply to the factory. The harvester is capable of reaping both green canes as well as burnt canes. The harvested sugarcane are transported to the factory in punts along waterways. Punts are elongated boats made from steel which were introduced by the Dutch. The punts are first moored along the edge of the field where they are then loaded manually or semi-mechanically. Uh, the loaded punts are then attached by strong chains, forming a fleet which is then hauled along the auxiliary water channel by oxen. It is then pulled by tractors along the main water channel if the time is dry. If the time is wet, it is pulled by water tugs. Between 20 to 30 loaded punts can be dragged by one tractor. This method of transportation is, there, is therefore very environmentally friendly as it reduces the amount of exhaust released into the atmosphere. At the mill, the bundled cane in each punt is lifted and released to the cane carrier for processing to begin. Processing involves the extraction of the cane juice from the fibrous residue or bagasse of the cane plant. Since the juice contains impurities known as filter mud, these impurities must also be removed before the juice is crystallized to form the sugar. Molasses is one of the byproducts of the refining process. The molasses may be further refined in some cases to produce ethanol. Notice that the main brands of sugar are named according to the areas from which the sugar is grown, including the Demerara and Burbese brand. Producing the products is only one part of the story. The next part is, the, is to actually distribute and sell the items in an effort to make a profit. Guyana's sugar is sold on different markets in different quantities and at different prices. The table shows some of the markets and the prices for which one ton of Guyana's sugar is sold. The greater the price, the greater is the profit margin. But if you notice from the information being shown, the production cost is larger than the price on all the markets. This means that the country is actually producing at a loss and therefore requires the input 
of money into the industry by the government for the industry to stay afloat. Additionally, some of the markets where the sugar is sold for the highest prices only purchase a very small quantity of the sugar. Now, historically, Guyana, like other Commonwealth countries, had access to the UK's market through the Commonwealth Sugar Agreement. When the UK joined the EU, the Commonwealth Sugar Agreement became part of the European Market Access Agreement Protocol. This provided Guyana with duty-free but quota access to European market at guaranteed preferential prices. Prices for sugar were significantly higher than the world market prices. However, these agreements have changed over time as a number of reforms have taken place in the EU's agricultural sector. Currently, marketing is framed under the Economic Partnership Agreement. Now, Guyana has less share of the European market and the price for sugar has been significantly reduced. With European market becoming less reliable, the importance of regional and local markets have been strengthened. Guyana's Demerara sugar is shipped in either bulk form or as bagged sugar. Some of the bulk sugar goes to a small North American market. Some are shipped to Trinidad under the Common External Tariff Agreement. The majority of the bulk sugar is still exported to Europe. Bagged sugars are shipped to neighboring CARICOM countries under the Common External Tariff Agreement and is also distributed within the domestic markets of Guyana to local retailers, manufacturers, and food services. Most of the molasses is sold to local rum distilleries and the remainder is distributed among islands uh, such as Barbados, Antigua, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent. Okay, so this is where I end a very long video. Uh, please understand that this is a uh, an industry that is constantly changing. So it is important for you to do your own research to keep up to date in terms of what is currently going on. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like, to share, and to subscribe to Geography Journey.